Welcome back to our broadcast. President Trump has repeatedly downplayed his business ties to Russia, but a fascinating new piece of journalism tracks three decades of Russian money connected to Trump properties. Uh, Trump's Russian laundromat reads the headline in the New Republic, quote, whether Trump knew it or not, Russian mobsters and corrupt oligarchs use Trump's properties not only to launder vast sums of money from extortion, drugs, gambling, and racketeering, but even as a base of operations for their criminal activities. Without the Russian mafia, it is fair to say Donald Trump would not be president of the United States. That is a weighty charge. And with us tonight, the author of this piece, Craig Unger, a contributor at the New Republic. Before I even let you say a word, I've got another paragraph I want to read to you that you wrote. Over the past three decades, at least 13 people with known or alleged links to Russian mobsters or oligarchs have owned, lived in, and even run criminal activities out of Trump Tower and other other Trump properties. Many used his apartments and casinos to launder untold millions in dirty money. Some ran a worldwide high stakes gambling ring out of Trump Tower in a unit directly below one owned by Trump. So, weighty charges indeed. When I ask you, when I meet you on the street, what, the basic question what is it about Trump and the Russians? Which may be even harder to answer. How do you answer? Well, there's been a lot of great reporting about Trump and the Russians lately, but if you want to know when he was first compromised by the Russians, I go back uh, 33 years to 1984, and at that time, a guy named David Bogdan walked into Trump Tower. He was a Russian immigre, and he had ties to the most powerful crime ring in, in Russia. And he sat down with Donald Trump, and he bought not one apartment, not two, but five condos in, in Trump Towers. And the state attorney general later you ruled that, that that was laundering money. And Trump Towers, in many ways, had been set up as a perfect vehicle for money laundering. It was one of, at the time, it was one of only two buildings in New York City uh, where anonymous people could use shell companies to buy condominiums. Um, do you, <clears throat> is there a quid versus a pro quo? I mean, with Trump having been accused of being so transactional, is there a long um, debt, this, this reason to bend over backwards to show Russia and Putin the benefit of the doubt? What's the active extortion compromise threat that you allege that you found? Well, I think in the early days it was probably simply a matter of money laundering. The, the, the Russian mafia got their money laundered and Trump sold a lot of condos and presumably didn't ask questions. Uh, but things changed dramatically around 2002. And at the time, Trump uh, was still reeling from his massive expansion in Atlantic City. He had ended up with owing $4 billion to 70 banks. I mean, those are not the kind of things you want on your resume if you're going to be running for president of the United States. And in 2002, a company called Bayrock moved into Trump Tower. It's a real estate company. And it, too, allegedly had ties to the Russian mafia. And they made uh, Donald Trump an offer he could not refuse. They were going to put up about a billion dollars in financing. Trump put up zero, and yet he got 18 percent of the profits on their joint ventures. Was he aware of all of this all the way along? And we recommend to our viewers it's a long piece, but set aside some time and read it. Uh, was he a, an unwitting participant? You know, I have no idea what was going through Donald Trump's mind, and I don't you think that's that the kind clear. of thing. Uh, but I, I think you can see that from the, the way the building was set up and the massive amounts of, of you know, finding 13 people. Frankly, I think that's the tip of the iceberg, and the reason I think that is that a huge number of uh, people who buy the condos use these shell companies. Since the election, about 70 percent of the sales in Trump-branded condos have been through shell companies, so there's no way for reporters to penetrate that. A special counselor, though, uh, counsel is another matter. Especially one who has hired first-rate attorneys, especially in this area of financial crimes. Again, an exhaustive piece. We recommend everyone read it, meet your own conclusions. We thank Craig Unger for stopping by our studios tonight. Thanks for having me, Brian. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.
Did the New York Military Academy do that for you, or were you always like that? I think, and maybe this is a part of the book and what's happening, I think that people tend to be what they are. People really have it, or they don't have it. People tend to be what they are. One of the most enduring television personalities, some might call him the father of daytime talk shows, interviewed Donald Trump 30 years ago, just after the release of The Art of the Deal. And joining me now is the great Phil Donahue. <laughs> I look like I just made my first communion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm both excited and intimidated. So thank you for being here. Um, it has been a real you know, dream come true to get you on the show. But I want to ask you about, about that interview. So you interviewed Donald Trump in 1987. He was on the show three times. He was on the show three times. But this interview it came in a very interesting year, in my view, in Donald Trump's life. He was really pushing the Reagan administration to make him some sort of Russian ambassador. He styled mm -hmm. himself a potential future president. When you spoke to him back then, did you see a potential future president? Someone in your audience even Are you him. serious? <laughs> yeah, did you think he could Oh, run? not even in a million years. <laughs> um, well, who did? Yeah. yeah. I thought he was a hot dog. Um... And I, you know, I kind of gave him a little stiff arm. I said on that interview, I said, I think I like your father better than you. <laughs> um, but, you know, but he held up all right. He, you know, I wasn't nasty or mean. Uh, but he really, he reached out. He worked hard to, he collected celebrities mm -hmm. um, and uh, made a lot of noise and got his name on a lot of buildings. Yep. And where were we when that happened? Yeah. I mean, why didn't you think of that, Joy? Well, you know, it's interesting because I, f I feel that when people say, well, Donald Trump has changed so much, to me, he seems the same. Every, you know, if you go back to the 80s and you listen to him talk, talk to him, you listen to him talk now, he's sort of the same guy. And one of the ways he's the same is that he did have this emphasis, the emphasis and you talked to him about loyalty. I want to play another clip of it. Um, and this is about Donald Trump's loyalty. And this was a question you asked him about Roy Cohn, the infamous mm. Roy Cohn, uh, being his lawyer during that federal case that the Nixon administration administration mm -hmm. brought for racial discrimination in his father's buildings. Take a listen. Loyal. Exactly. And loyalty is a great trait. In yeah. my opinion, it's a great trait. Yeah. It's a trait that maybe can cause problems, but it's also a great trait. Right. So now you see this guy demanding loyalty from Jim Comey, demanding loyalty, his son essentially trying to take the fall right. for him. What do you make of it? Same, same old, uh, same old. Yeah. Um, he's very, uh, and he can't handle, obviously, Anyone who disagrees. Right. How about the cabinet meeting where everybody, you know, like bobbleheads, you know, am I great? Am I great? Yes, you are. Yeah. yeah I mean, that was, that was um, yeah. icky. I mean, anybody who was capable of that and didn't see the horror of demanding this kind of public proclamations of loyalty and, yeah. um, uh, you know, just a total fidelity to the king. Yeah. And, you know, one of the, the things, uh, you know, that I guess the media missed on during the campaign that you had to sort of be a Trump supporter to get is that he did, even back in the 1980s, make this appeal to a certain kind of American who feels put upon by foreigners, put upon by, you know, people of color, whatever it is they're put upon by. And this is Donald Trump back in 1987 talking about um, Japan and other countries ripping off the country. Take a listen. Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, they're ripping off this country, and I don't like seeing it. Other countries have to pay us for the services we're rendering, or this country is going to go right down the tubes. It is no different than his campaign appeal. Really? It's really? no different. And that's, that's, um, that's a variation on the theme that I think earned him so much uh, voting power, enough to become president. He would go to these, I wondered, who were these people under the... You know, they raise their, when he walks out in the big yeah. rallies, yeah. and they have their iPhones up here, yeah. taking his picture, and you can yeah. see the back. Who were these people? And I, slow learner that I am, and I think mainstream elite media, as he would say, also missed this story. These were people who work hard, aren't sure their company isn't going to be sold. Uh, kids can't get a job. They're home watching ESPN. <laughs> They um, uh, can't get the, the minimum wage raised yeah. beyond $10 an hour. And he comes out in that rally, clapping, mm -hmm. and he says, you're being ripped off. And these people said, yes. And that was 
what put him in the White House. And I think the so-called, as he would call it, mainstream media mm -hmm. missed, largely missed that story. Yeah. Not Bernie, but most of the mainstream media really yeah. didn't get that. And, and now that everyone's caught up and realized that, oh, oh yeah, he definitely has a strong appeal to them, do you think there's anything that could break Trump voters from him? There's a, a recent piece out in which uh, a Trump voter says, well, I guess if he killed someone in cold blood, I'd change my mind. I, I mean, it's really, it's all, well, he can shoot a gun down Fifth Avenue, yeah. right? Yeah, and get away with it. it seems like uh, he, yeah, and uh, all of a sudden we got a a crotch grabber for a president. Yeah. This is the darkest political moment in American history. I'm Who's going to argue that? And I'm wondering too, because you know, one of the things about the, that period in, in, in the 80s was there was a certain sort of Dallas and dynasty culture. There was this sort of love of celebrity. The Reagan sort of gave off that era. And Donald Trump. This is Donald Trump uh, also in your interview talking about his book sales because the art of the deal had come out, which Tony Schwartz actually wrote, but that he took credit for. Uh, this is Donald Trump talking about his book sales. The front page of the Wall Street Journal today tells us that they're printing 150,000 copies tweaked your cheek a bit. You said there were 200. Exaggerating, yeah, Mr. Height. No, I'll tell you truthfully, it, I thought it was 200, and I think it will be 200, but I'm not sure what it is. I don't know what it is exactly. It's 150 to 200,000, uh -huh. I guess. Hyping and lying, two things that, oh, again, have also not changed. Do you think deep down that maybe in the id of a lot of Americans, they kind of like a, a hype man, a kind of, they kind of like a cat? Absolutely. Yeah. He, he's an antidote to what they see <clears throat> as the uh, pomposity. Mm -hmm of mainstream media, people on television. Mm -hmm. They know stuff you don't know, and they're fed up with it. Uh, and we're not talking about them. Pete, uh, uh, his name is Bujovic. He's the mayor of South Bend, Indiana. Oh, Pete, Bud Pete Buttigieg. Mm -hmm. Buttigieg, thank mm -hmm. you. Um, he is saying, my people, my constituents are saying, what about me? Well, you know, but this is the question I have whenever I hear that. Don't we talk about these folks all the time? There have been so many stories of this particular Trump voter staring soulfully out a window that I think you could print an entire thick New York Times of just that picture. Yeah. We talk about them every day. There are polls about them every week. We're constantly talking about these people. How can they feel not talked about? We talk about them every day. Well, uh, this is a hard point to make because it is true. Uh, not everything sucks. <laughs> uh, I mean, there are, uh, I've had Howard Stern on my show, so <laughs> you watch my language. Um, it is true. There's, there's a lot of good work going on, and they're, not all the media deserves to be criticized. I see these women in Iraq and Afghanistan with the helmets, and I think, holy cow, what if their parents are watching? <laughs> you know, come home, honey. Daddy will get you a job at Starbucks. <laughs> you know? But, and it is true, it wasn't totally ignored. But it wasn't hit with all the same graphics and computer animation. Trump, 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 Trump mm -hmm. was such a magnet that I think they were overlooked. And I think they have a right to say, what about me? Because I don't think media dug deep enough to see the pain out there, the broken hearts, the disappointments, the people who believed in America, went to church every Sunday and sang in the choir and they I think they were ignored I just do I have one last question because this your interview took place the same year that Donald Trump took out this uh, full page ad in the New York Times Boston Globe and other places the top of the ad says there's nothing wrong with America's foreign defense policy that a little backbone can't cure it was an open letter slamming Ronald <coughs> Reagan uh, essentially um, but also putting forward this very pro-Russia line even back then what do you make of the fact that you now have a significant share of Republicans who are okay with an American presidential candidate colluding with Russia? What do you make of that? I think he's Elvis. I don't think they will tolerate, uh, many of the base will not tolerate a criticism of him. I mean, if he can, if he can talk to, like to Billy, uh, when he got off the bus. Billy Bush, yeah. Billy Bush. If he can talk that way, if they accept that, yeah. Um, and also, this is uh, this is distant from them. This doesn't speak to their heart. And uh, I think, honestly, I don't think he can be impeached right now. I think it's too dangerous for a member of Congress to vote for impeachment 
and upset a significant number of his own constituency. Yeah. It's a third rail. He could risk his own reelection. Yeah. Well, Phil Donahue, it is such a treat to talk to you. My pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time. Hopefully we can lure you back. <laughs> Thank, All right. you. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. And up next, why Donald Trump's latest visit to his golf course may be his most controversial yet. Details coming up. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos. The President of the United States attacked the Attorney General of the United States in an interview with the New York Times published tonight. This is something we have never seen before. This leaves the Attorney General no choice. He must resign. Attorney General Jeff Sessions gave the New York Times no comment, absolutely no comment, when he was told what the president said about him, and the New York Times asked for comment about that. The president told the New York Times that he regrets appointing Jeff Sessions, and when a president expresses no confidence in a cabinet member, then that cabinet member owes the president his resignation. When a president does it publicly, which is something we just have never seen before, then that cabinet member really has no choice from that minute forward, absolutely no choice. Here is some of the New York Times audio recording of what the president said. Sessions gets the job. Right after he gets the job, he recuses himself. Was that a mistake? Well, Sessions should have never recused himself. And if he would, if he was going to recuse himself, he should have told me before he took the job, and I would have picked somebody else. Mm -hmm. He gave you no heads up at all. Mm -hmm. Zero. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Jeff Sessions takes the job, gets into the job, recuses himself. I then have, uh, which, which frankly, I think it's very unfair to the president. Mm -hmm. How do you take a job and then recuse yourself? If he would have recused himself before the job, I would have said, thanks, Jeff, but I can't, you know, I'm not going to take you. It's extremely unfair, and that's a mild word to the president. So he recuses himself. That's it. That is amazing. And it is amazing that Jeff Sessions is still in the job. Any self-respecting attorney general of the United States would have publicly resigned as soon as the president's words became public earlier this evening. It is now clear that Jeff Sessions is going to be a witness against the president of the United States. And that's the, and that the it's also clear that the president's defense to Special Prosecutor Mueller is going to be, I don't remember. Those will be his words. The New York Times interview shows that the president believes he can get through the special prosecutor's investigation of obstruction of justice with the simple words, I don't remember. In his interview with the New York Times, the president disagreed sharply, contradicted former FBI director James Comey's description of a February 14th meeting in the Oval Office in which the president kicked everyone out of the room so that he could speak alone to James Comey. In James Comey's now public under oath account of that meeting and in his notes, James Comey said that the president asked everyone to leave the room, including Jared Kushner, including Vice President Mike Pence, and including Attorney General Jeff Sessions. To the New York Times, the president says he doesn't remember kicking anyone out of the room. Quote, I don't remember even talking to him about any of this stuff, Mr. Trump said of Mr. Comey. He said, I asked people to go. Look, you look at his testimony. His testimony is loaded up with lies, okay? Question mark. So Jared Kushner and the vice president and everyone else who was in the room is going to be asked under oath, who is telling the truth, James Comey or Donald Trump? Attorney General Jeff Sessions is going to be asked under oath by the special prosecutor, did President Trump order everyone out of the room? Did he order you out of the room? What do you think Jeff Sessions is going to say under oath in answer to that question, which is a key obstruction of justice question? Because the obstruction of justice case against the president 
is very much about that meeting, very much about what was his incentive for kicking everyone out of that room to have a private conversation with the FBI director. Did he intend to obstruct justice in that conversation and not want any witnesses? Jeff Sessions is going to be asked, did the president kick you out of the room? Do you think Jeff Sessions is going to simply say he agrees with Donald Trump and just doesn't remember? Or do you think he's just going to say, yes, yes, the president kicked us out of the room? Do you think Jeff Sessions is going to agree with former FDI directors under oath testimony, James Comey's under oath testimony that he's already given? Do you think Jeff Sessions is going to agree or contra try to contradict James Comey's written notes about that meeting? You think he's going to try to help the president? You think Jeff Sessions is going to try to help the president and say, I don't remember? Is Mike Pence going to say, I don't remember? Is Jared Kushner going to say, I don't remember? Attorney General Jeff Sessions' desire if he ever had it, to be helpful to the president in his testimony to the special prosecutor, Robert Mueller, cannot be as strong tonight as it might have been last night. Jeff Sessions has been publicly attacked by the president. And in the middle of that attack, the president told all of his teammates who were in the Oval Office that day how he is going to testify when Robert Mueller asks him under oath if he kicked all of them out of the room when he asked to speak with James Comey alone. He's going to testify, I don't remember. And he's giving all of the other witnesses in the case, all of the witnesses on his team who were in the Oval Office that day the signal right now, tonight, of how he wants them to handle that question. The president is making it publicly clear that on that question, the Trump position is I don't remember. And on that question, it's going to be Donald Trump's credibility versus James Comey's credibility. And everyone in that room is going to have to choose a side. And there is no reason tonight, none, for Jeff Sessions to do any favors for Donald Trump in his testimony. Jeff Sessions may have always simply planned to tell the truth about that moment in the Oval Office, in which case nothing might have changed for him tonight about his crucial testimony about that moment when James Comey says Jeff Sessions and everyone else was kicked out of the Oval Office. But how can Jeff Sessions go back to work tomorrow? How can he do that? How can he walk into the Justice Department? How can Jeff Sessions attend the next cabinet meeting as the only member of the cabinet who the president has publicly attacked and said he wished he didn't nominate him. He wished he wasn't the attorney general. The president has the most incompetent cabinet in history, and he's unhappy with only one of them, only Jeff Sessions. When the New York Times asked the president today if Robert Mueller's investigation would cross a red line, if it, if it expands to look at the Trump family's finances, Mr. Trump said, I would say yes. I think that's a violation. Look, this is about Russia. After that interview was published tonight, the New York Times published another story about how the Trump family finances are already being investigated. Banking regulators are reviewing hundreds of millions of dollars in loans made to Mr. Trump's businesses through Deutsche Bank's private wealth management unit, unit which caters to an ultra-rich clientele, according to three people briefed on the review who were not authorized to speak publicly. The bank is expecting to eventually have to provide information to Robert Mueller, the special counsel overseeing the federal investigation into the Trump campaign's ties to Russia. Deutsche Bank has also lent money to Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law and senior advisor, and to his family real estate business, although Deutsche Bank recently landed in legal trouble for laundering money for Russian entities, paying more than $600 million in penalties to New York and British regulators. There is no indication of a Russian connection to Mr. Trump's loans or accounts at Deutsche Bank. People briefed on the matter said. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos. I'm President Trump met with Russian officials in the Oval Office back in May. He reportedly revealed highly classified information from Israel.
and told them that firing James Comey, who he called at the time a nut job, relieved great pressure on him with regards to the Russian investigation. Well, yesterday we learned the president met alone with an hour for an hour with Vladimir Putin at the G20 conference over in Germany, an hour, just the two of them. The only other person present was a Russian translator supplied by the Kremlin itself. Well, the White House never disclosed that meeting. It was first reported by Ian, Ian Bremer, who's president of the international consulting firm the Eurasia Group. Let's watch. I will tell you that, you know, many of the leaders uh, that were in that room, including, you know, America's most important allies, were quite surprised. Uh, they found it unusual and noteworthy, uh, the body language, the chemistry, uh, the fact that it went on for so long, and the fact that, of course, it reflected a much warmer relationship between Trump and Putin than he has with any of the other leaders in the room. Well, White House spokesman Sean Spicer, for what it's worth, told The New York Times this about the G20 meeting. Quote, it was pleasantries and small talk. How would Sean know? President Trump tweeted today, quote, fake news story of secret dinner with Putin is sick. All G20 leaders and spouses were invited by Chancellor of Germany. Well, we all know that. But what happened afterwards? Also today, The Washington Post reported President Trump is planning on ending the CIA's covert program to arm and train moderate Syrian rebels. So we're on a side side now. Anyway, according to the Post, officials said the phasing out of the secret program reflects Trump's interest in finding ways to work with Russia, which saw the anti-Assad program as an assault on his or its interests. NBC News has not confirmed the report. I'm joined right now by James Clapper, the former director of intelligence, national intelligence under President Obama. Mr. Director, from the beginning, uh, Donald Trump has said his whole goal with Russia is to try to develop a deal of some kind to fight ISIS. And it looks like everything he's been doing so far, forgiving them on Crimea, forgiving them on eastern Ukraine, even just seeming to forgive them on interfering with our elections, if not bringing a blind eye to it, and now apparently to forgive them for supporting ISIS. It's coming across to me like a Polaroid film. It's just developing in front of us. This is what Trump is up to. You're the expert. What do you see Trump doing here? Well, it's, uh, it seems clear to me that he's very, very interested in uh, uh, a productive working relationship uh, with the Russians. Um, I guess the concern I would have is uh, what concessions uh, have been made or are being made. and. Uh, if there are, are concessions being made or agreements being made, what is it? What's the quid pro quo for us? What is the United States uh, getting out of this? You know, I, I've, I've read the media reporting about uh, stopping our support for the uh, moderate opposition groups, which is a very profound move. And I should caveat by saying that's certainly his prerogative uh, as the president to do that. But there are serious implications here. One is it appears to me that he's just kind of thrown in with the Russians and uh, helping them as they have sustained propping up uh, Assad, who, by the way, was the original cause of the civil war in uh, Syria to, to start with. And, of course, if, if we're stopping that assistance, then we're cutting the knees out from under these uh, moderate opposition groups who've, who've grown very uh, dependent on us. And, of course, I think another aspect here is uh, gauge what the reaction of the regional neighbors are. I read, again, that Jordan is supportive. I'm not sure all the others uh, would be. So th this, uh, if this is true, <clears throat> this uh, it has huge implications. Mr. Director, what do you make of that first meeting in June of last year? It seemed to be the first meeting when Donald Jr. was approached, Donald Trump Jr. was approached with a proposition that the Russians, apparently at the government level, had some dirt on Hillary Clinton. Based on your knowledge of Russian methods, what were they up to there in establishing a relationship with Trump's son? Well, I think, first of all, this was the uh, classic textbook Soviet and now Russian tradecraft, uh, kind of, a, you know, the soft approach. Uh, and I think their principle, they had two objectives here. One was to determine whether uh, th those close to uh, then-candidate Trump would, uh, would be interested in talking with him about uh, and receiving uh, dirt on, on Hillary Clinton. That was point one. And point two uh, was uh, plausible deniability. And these are uh, characteristics of a typical Soviet-slash-Russian uh, intelligence service tradecraft. 
and I think that was the primary objective, just to find out if, uh, uh, if they reached out, if there would be interest uh, evinced, and there was. And what kind of a response do you think they got? Because Trump seemed very pro-Russian in the months after that. Well, that's true. Uh, he uh, and he evinced that uh, when uh, we published our intelligence community assessment on the 6th of January and briefed him at Trump Tower about the Russian interference uh, in our election in 2016. And uh, he, of course, uh, was skeptical about it, although he wasn't well we briefed him, but in subsequent uh, commentary was uh, disparaging of it. In fact, at one point characterized us as uh, Nazis, uh, I guess, for having uh, uh, reported uh, to, to him uh, what our uh, judgment was about the, the magnitude and the extent and the scope of uh, Russian interference, which, uh, uh, and the results for them, I think, are all they're going to do is, uh, they're going to do it more. They're, they're going to be back there, and they're going to be emboldened to be more aggressive. So even after sending the message to Manafort, Paul Manafort, the chairman of his campaign at the time, and his son, that they were on his side, that they were willing to help him hurt Hillary Clinton in the campaign, even after getting that message clear as a bell, he told you folks, the intelligence experts, that he didn't believe that the Russians were trying to help him. Well, he didn't. Uh, he just kept um, iterating the possibility that, uh, well, it could, could have been somebody else, could have been the 400-pound guy in his bed in New Jersey, yeah. uh, and it, it kind of reiterated that message during, in his speech uh, in Poland. Yeah, but it wasn't a 400-pound person lying in their bed that came to his people, four of them in Trump, four, three of them in Trump Tower, including his son-in-law and his son and his campaign chairman. That wasn't a 400-pound person in their bed that came to him with the dirt on Hillary uh, that's from right. Russia. Uh, that's right. And I, 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 I mention that only because I think he was trying to uh, 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 apparently obfuscate um, uh, the the origins of this uh, interference. And uh, just to be clear, in our minds uh, and the intel in the minds of the intelligence community, the, the agencies that participated in this, there's absolutely no doubt it was clearly the Russians. We had a very high confidence level about that, and still do. Well, Let's talk about his reaction to all this. We know that uh, he's denied the dossier, and that's a, a dispute. And, but yet he has been so nice to the Russians. He was nice to uh, Mr. Gorbachev or Mr. Uh, Mr. Putin in the uh, in the G20 meeting openly. And then when they had the private meeting, went over and sat with him with just a uh, his own uh, Putin's own translator interpreter there, and he spent that hour with him there. And now today, as you point out, he brings out this uh, new overture in terms of. Uh, uh, supporting Assad basically by opposing or giving no more funding to the opponents of Assad, the, uh, the side that we've been on all these months. That adds up to me as cooperation and collusion. What do you think? Well, it's uh, very concerning to me that uh, uh, this appears to be, to be going on. I, I, I understand uh, the, it's a good thing to look for areas where our interests uh, converge, but it seems to me what we're doing is suborning our interests to those of the Russians. Um, and uh, if this is true about uh, the action in, in Syria, well, this is a very, this is a very serious uh, thing. And uh, this um, affinity for uh, Russia uh, is uh, a very curious thing. And bear in mind, uh, Russia is an existential threat to this country. They are embarked on a very aggressive modernization program for their strategic nuclear forces. They have a very aggressive a counter space program. And these are uh, all designed with one adversary in mind, and that's the United, United States. And oh, by the way, uh, they're also in violation of the INF Treaty. So I have trouble understanding why we're being so solicitous of, of, of Russia, uh, who are, are not our friends and are not doing any, are not going to do anything that's in our interests. Lastly, how would you describe uh, President Trump's response to this adversary since taking office? Well, uh, again, it, it appears to me that uh, the approach to be taken here is to be very solicitous uh, of the Russians. Uh, and again, if, if our, uh, the action that I've read in the media about uh, Syria is, is true, it seems to me what we're doing is essentially subordinating ourselves to the Russians as they sustain uh, 
uh, Assad, which has been their position uh, all along. And I think what that does in the long run is, is really uh, uh, marginalize whatever leverage uh, we had in influencing developments there. When, one, when an American or any uh, other power lays down before uh, Putin, what's Putin's reaction to that, generally? How does he like that kind of response, that well, acceptance? Uh, he, he revels in it. Uh, he is, in my view, not a throwback necessarily to the Soviet era, but a, a throwback to the Tsar uh, era. He's not really an ideologue. I think he has this uh, Russian greatness uh, yeah. mindset and that Russia is a great power in the world and that uh, he he uh, craves that kind of recognition. Uh, he uses that recognition to, uh, um, you know, I think uh, intimidate his own people and uses that as a way of trying to exhort their patriotism. So this all, th this uh, phenomenon here uh, plays plays right to his uh, his sweet spot. Do you think uh, our president is helping uh, Russia be great again? Uh, in a, in, yeah, in a way, I guess uh, he is. Uh, particularly if uh, as Putin, you know, gets his way in uh, in Syria, and uh, if nothing is done to push back on the Russians in in Ukraine, um, yes. Okay. James. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos. We're joined now by phone by Rosalind Helderman, one of the reporters who broke this story about the president considering pardons for himself, for his family, for his staff. Broke that story tonight in the Washington Post. Uh, Rosalind, thank you very much for joining us tonight. We've all been studying every word of this story. Pardons is just one component of it. We're going to come back to that. But tell us w uh, some of the other discoveries you've, re you've been reporting in this story tonight. Well, sure. The pardons discussion we understand is part of sort of a broader conversation going on uh, with the president and his team uh, about ways that they could limit or curtail uh, the Mueller investigation. Uh, there is great unhappiness on the part of the president that the investigation appears to be expanding rapidly day by day and particularly appears to now be looking at his finances. Uh, the, the written order establishing the special uh, counsel, uh, excuse me, the special counsel um, gave him authority to look at collusion with Russia and at matters that arise or arose directly out of that probe. And so there's conversation about are all of these other things really things that should be considered matters that arose directly from the Russia probe? Yeah, and the uh, the the probe can, as we've seen with special prosecutors in the past, they can stumble upon anything. They can be uh, looking at some Russian connection and looking at some bank statement and then discover something that has nothing to do with the campaign, uh, and that would that would fall under something that arises directly from the investigation. Well, sure, and of course, who is the arbiter of whether or not they're uh, exceeding their their mandate, their written order? It's the same process you were just discussing, the attorney general, or in this case, because he's recused himself, the deputy attorney general. Uh, so it does seem as though part of this is a conversation about sort of making a public case uh, as opposed to sort of a legal case. Uh, we, we're also uh, told that there is a lot of conversation about possible conflicts on the part of Mueller and members of his team, uh, a new one that we were reported this evening is apparently there's a discussion of Bob Mueller's membership at, uh, of all things, the Trump National Golf Course in Northern Virginia, where he was a member until 2011, and some variety of, uh, we're told by White House advisors, dispute over his membership fees at that club. Now, I should say a spokesman for uh, Bob Mueller has told us uh, that uh, no such dispute occurred, uh, so we're going to have to uh, learn a little bit more about that. Uh, but this active effort to find ways to undercut the probe uh, by saying it's grown too large beyond its scope and by looking at conflicts by uh, Mueller and his team. Uh, Rosalyn, I want to go back to that, uh, that golf membership, which seems so trivial uh, when, when you mention it, but there's something really important in it in your story, which really jumped out at me, and that is 
that a spokesperson for uh, the special prosecutor specifically responded to that one point and said that one point is completely untrue. And so when we say that the special prosecutor doesn't comment in any way, uh, that's 99% true because the special prosecutor did comment tonight about this dispute uh, with the Donald Trump uh, golf club being untrue. Yeah, you, you make a good point. I mean, clearly there was something about uh, that particular topic, and I guess uh, because it has to do with him personally, uh, that they felt like they could or should respond to. And there's a, there's, you also uh, talk about in, in the piece Mark Corallo, who was the spokesperson uh, for the Trump legal team who just quit uh, that job, uh, quitting within 24 hours of this interview that Donald Trump did with the New York Times that the legal team knew nothing about. Uh, that was very much about the, the work that the legal team is working on, and, that, and you report that that interview with the New York Times came after a meeting uh, with the legal team uh, run by the new member of the team, Ty Cobb, the new lawyer on the team, uh, and in that meeting, Ty Cobb believed that he got an agreement for a new kind of discipline from the president who was in the meeting uh, and everyone else involved, a new kind of discipline about public comments about this. And then within 24 hours of that, the president is doing this wild interview with The New York Times, which others in the White House didn't know about, legal team didn't know about. And right after that, we see Mark Corallo, the spokesperson for the legal team, quits. It's hard to think that that interview with The New York Times and being blindsided like that uh, is unrelated to Mark Corallo quitting. Yeah, I mean, it seems like there's a certain amount of restructuring that's going on in the legal team. I mean, you've got that timeline right, and uh, it may well be that there's some connection between those events. Uh, so we've got Corallo resigning tonight. There's also reporting this evening that Mark Kasowitz's role uh, is going to be, uh, he, of course, is the president's private attorney, uh, who's been seen sort of as the, as the chief uh, responder on Russia, uh, that, that his role is going to be um, uh, reduced, uh, oh, but though he will still be there. Uh, there's also uh, Jay Sekulow, who's sort of the public face of the team. He goes on television, and uh, John Dowd, who's uh, kind of more of a, a veteran watch Washington hand, uh, uh, who's going to be doing more of the work behind the scenes. Uh, Rosalind, it, I, I noticed that some of your sources, some uh, unnamed uh, sources on this uh, within the Trump world, uh, talking about the president's inquiries about his pardon. Yeah.